After decades of rumors, the mid-engine Corvette is finally actually happening. So what took GM and Chevy so long to build it? And is it gonna be successful? Let's talk about it. The Chevrolet Corvette has always sat in its own weird little niche in the market. It's pricier than the Ford Mustang, so GM invented the Camaro to compete with that car. It's well known that the father of the Corvette, Zora Arcus Duntop, was a racer and a big proponent of the mid-engine layout. And it's fairly common knowledge that mid-engine is better for performance than the typical front-engine format. So if the VET has always been GM's halo car and wasn't in any direct competition with other cars anyway, why didn't they go whole hog a long time ago? Well, the history of the mid-engine Corvette is one of bad timing and conservative decisions. It all started with the 1960 Serve, which stood for either Corporate Engineering Research Vehicle or Chevrolet Engineering Research Vehicle. It was a single-seater race car that was never intended to be a Corvette. Arcus Duntov used it as a test bed for the mid-engine layout and suspension design. But GM was against any actual racing involvement. Its independent rear suspension did end up in the 1963 Stingray Corvette, though. When the Ford GT40 took the racing world by storm a few years later, Zora kicked back into gear and developed the mid-engine Serve 2. His team came up with some very interesting ideas. They moved the transmission behind the differential and added a second transmission that was driven off the front of the crankshaft. That's right, this thing was all-wheel drive. Despite how cool this thing was, GM decided to quietly support Chaparral race cars in Can-Am instead of openly going after Ford at Le Mans. That meant no production mid-engine Corvette either. Next came the experimental XP880, also called the Astro 2, in 1968. This was the first time anything actually resembling a mid-engine Corvette would show up, and it looked pretty badass. But the two-speed transaxle borrowed from the Pontiac Tempest couldn't handle the huge V8 they put in it. The 1970 New York Auto Show was the debut of the first official mid-engine Corvette concept, the XP882. It had a transversely mounted small block V8 and used an Oldsmobile Toronado transaxle to make it all-wheel drive. What's with this all-wheel drive stuff? Zora Arcus Duntov rushed it to the show so Chevy could have a competitor to three other mid-engine cars that were rumored to be going into production. The AMC AMX3, the Mercedes-Benz C111, and the De Tomaso Pantera. Can't you see a measly effect by persistence? What's that from last year? It's not totally clear what happened after the XP882's auto show debut. One story is that John DeLorean, who was the boss of Chevy back then, wanted the Corvette to go a lower cost route. He killed the program and Arcus Duntov threatened to quit. Another story is that there was such a positive response to the XP882 that GM authorized more money for the further development that the team changed tactics and tried to develop a lighter rotary version instead. In the quest for progress, the mid-engine V8 plans were scrapped. There's evidence that both of these things happened. Just two years later, GM built the V8-powered XP895 prototype on the same chassis as the 882. It also ended up being too heavy, so DeLorean got one of GM's suppliers, Reynolds Metals, to make an aluminum body that was 500 pounds lighter than the steel one. But the cost of mass-producing aluminum-bodied Corvettes would have been too high, and the fiberglass C3 was selling really well anyway, so the XP895 was yet another dead end. One year later, a couple of mid-engine rotary prototypes appeared. The first one was the XP897 GT, which debuted in Frankfurt in 1973. It was built on a Porsche 914 chassis, oddly enough. The engine was a two-rotor Wankel making only 180 horses. Zora thought it was underpowered, no kidding, and didn't like the idea. So Arcus Duntov pulled one of the older prototypes out of storage and reworked it into get this, a four-rotor concept for the Paris Auto Show. It had gullwing doors for some reason, you know, like all concept cars. The interior looked pretty complete, which made people think that the mid-engine Corvette was finally gonna happen this time. But it wasn't the four-rotor of your glorious sounding dreams like the Mazda 787. <laughs> It was two of the two rotor Wenkels connected together with a V-belt to make 360 horsepower. As you might expect, that didn't work at all. And I'm kind of glad because that sounds like a nightmare. On top of that, it was 1973, which is when a little thing called the oil crisis started freaking everyone out. It just wasn't a good time to build thirsty engines, so GM didn't make any rotaries or the mid-engine vet. 
While the rotary idea was good and dead, Zora pulled the Winkles out, threw another V8 in, and renamed the concept the AeroVet. And this was his personal favorite of all the mid-engine Corvette prototypes. Zora retired in 1975, and in 76, the AeroVet was considered the possible future C4. The Datsun 280Z was eating into the aging C3 Corvette sales, and it seemed like it was the right time to finally do it. But the best that we can tell is that GM simply wussed out and kept going with the C3 until 1982, when Zora retired, he told his successor, Dave McClellan, that he has had to make a mid-engine Corvette someday. Another 10 years later went by before they built another mid-engine concept with help from Lotus, the 1986 Corvette Indy. It was a super advanced prototype with all-wheel drive, four-wheel steering, and hydraulic active suspension, and it was powered by a twin turbocharged 2.65 liter V8 making over 600 horses. Well, that's crazy. Its interior was stocked too with an early navigation system and a rear view camera. But the Indy was far too complex and expensive to be a viable option in the 80s, and it didn't get built. The Indy was toned down into a more production viable concept called Serve 3 for the 1990 Detroit Auto Show. This one had a twin turbocharged 5.7 LT5 making 650 horses, but it was estimated to cost $400,000 to produce, which was Porsche 959 and Ferrari F40 money. That wasn't gonna fly at Chevy, obviously. Serve 3 ended up being the final mid-engine Corvette concept we would see. McClellan's replacement, Dave Hill, was another front engine guy, but he did hire an assistant who was into it, a guy named Taj Wechter. I'm doing my best to pronounce it. He got GM's design department to make up a bunch of mid-engine engine models for wind tunnel testing, but the closest thing to it was the Cadillac CN concept at the Detroit Auto Show in 2002. This thing was in Midnight Club 3, you might remember it, with a huge 7.5 liter North Star V12 behind the driver, it's sick. After Hill retired, Wechter proposed the mid-engine Corvette to chief engineer Tom Wallace. He loved it. Then the bottom fell out of the economy, hitting the automotive industry really hard. GM was in especially bad shape, and you probably know they had to be bailed out by the government. Corvette development money was canceled completely. It was a terrible time to make a radical change. We're probably lucky the vet wasn't killed altogether. The fact that it's been a historically profitable and popular car probably saved its life. Thankfully, the markets bounced back a little bit from the financial crisis, and the C7 was a huge hit. The latest Corvette has incredible performance, but it's held back by its front engine layout. It seems like the time for the mid-engine Corvette was finally right, and Chevy debuted the long-awaited car on July 18th, and it looks absolutely wild. I love it! Power comes from a 6.2 liter mid-mounted V8 called the LT2. It makes 495 horsepower and 470 torques with a performance exhaust option. There's no word yet on power without that exhaust, but I'm sure it's gonna be super quick. All trims, including the base, come with a dry sump oil system so the engine won't run dry, even under continued loads over 1G. And they say that the base model can pull over a G on its standard all season tires. That's sick. It's got 19 inch wheels in the front and 20s in the back with four piston Brembo brakes on both ends. So far, it's only gonna come with an eight speed dual clutch transmission. And while I'm frankly a little disappointed there's no manual, a dual clutch is still really sick. Maybe they'll give us a clutch pedal later, but some people don't think it's possible. Test mules were spotted running with Porsche 911 turbos. So it looks like Chevy aimed this Corvette super high with their performance benchmarking. The mid-engine C8 should be super impressive. I, for one, am super stoked for the C8. It's gonna come out next year. The current age of a Corvette owner is 64, so GM has to be staking their hopes on this brand new layout, attracting new, younger buyers. And I think price is gonna be a big factor in the C8 Corvette success. The new base Stingray model is gonna start under $60,000. That's only a couple of grand more than the base C7 right now, and about the same as a Porsche Cayman, and a lot less than the Audi R8. Faster trim level are definitely coming and I can't wait to see how they stack up against McLarens and Ferraris and Lambos. I can't believe that I'm excited for a new Corvette, but it kind of has the stigma of being like your grandpa's car. But with this new mid-engine car, I'm just, I'm so excited for it. Big thanks to this week's sponsor, Pedal. Credit is really important, especially if you want to buy something big like a house or a motorcycle. The Pedal Card is great for anyone new to credit or trying to build credit. Pedal is partnered with Web Bank member FDIC and they issue a real life Visa credit card. Their variable APRs range from 15.24% to 26.24% and Pedal's credit limits range anywhere from $500 to $10,000 so you can always keep your credit utilization low. 
Pedal really wants to help you build your credit. So to reward you, right away they give you 1% cash back on everything you buy and they'll go up to 1.5% cash back after 12 on-time monthly payments. Pretty easy. Head over to pedalcard.com slash wheelhouse for more info and rev up your credit today. Support us by supporting the companies that support our shows. Now, how do I get off this thing? This is the brake, right? Or is this a clutch? Thanks for watching Wheelhouse. Chevy, please give us one to review. Everyone at Donut is super stoked. Check out this episode of Wheelhouse on Corvette versus the Thunderbird, one of our earlier episodes, still really good. Check out this episode of Up to Speed on the Corvette to get another history of the car so far. Hit me up on Instagram at Nolan J. Sykes. Follow Donut at Donut Media. If you like these shirts, we got them. Go to shop.donut.media. Be nice, see you next time.